Thank you for joining us on another edition of To Your Health here on GBMC's Facebook Live page. I'm your host, John Lazarou. Today we're going to talk about patient safety. And according to the Institute of Medicine, patient safety is not allowing harm to happen to a patient in a hospital. And it's also the cornerstone of high quality health care. But did you know that 98,000 people a year die in hospitals due to an incident of patient safety. And joining us today to talk about patient safety at the GBMC Healthcare System is the very own President and CEO of GBMC Healthcare, Dr. John Chassar. Dr. Chassar, thank you for coming today. Hi, John, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, I'm looking forward to it as well. You know, you and I talk every week, but a lot of our discussions, not many people in our audience or those watching at home know about the patient safety discussions that you and I have. So I'm, I'm glad you're here so we can shed some light. So right off the bat, I wanna talk about the GBMC healthcare vision, okay? We're gonna bring it up on the board right behind us. If you could read that, please, Dr. Chassar. To every patient, every time, we will provide the care that we would want for our own loved ones. So do me a favor, give me a little historic background on this vision, how it came about, and really explain its meaning to our audience. So our board, uh, who are the overseers of GBMC, they represent you as the owners back in, in 2010, uh, you all recall when people were yelling at each other about health care reform, they did something adult. They went off on a retreat to try to uh, decide where they wanted GBMC to go into the future. And they, uh, they looked at some of the data and they commissioned me and the team to change the direction slightly of GBMC to be a community-based system of care that uh, the patient would experience as a system that would to deliver to everyone every time the care that we would want for our own loved ones. And that's where this vision phrase came from. The actual vision statement is a bit more complicated. Then we had a conversation about what is it that you want for your loved one if you're escorting them to care at any level. What is it that you want? And we came up with our four aims because every person that I've ever had a conversation about this with wants their loved one to get better. Now we realize at end of life it's not always possible, but, and we have Gilchrist Hospice in our system of care, but even at the end of life, you want your loved one to have their pain and suffering reduced to the extent possible by the evidence. So the best clinical outcome is the first thing that we want for our loved ones, but it's not only that. We also want an excellent care experience. We want kindness. We don't want inordinate waiting. We want a clean facility. We don't want a lot of extraneous noise. So the care experience is the second thing that we want for our own loved ones. The third thing, and it, it's especially important in the United States of America where we spend 40% more per capita on healthcare than any other country in the world, we, sh we are desperate to not waste your loved one's resources. You know that in the United States of America, the estimates are 25 to 30% of all dollars spent are actually waste. They don't actually lead to a better health outcome or a better care experience. So we want to get rid of that waste to be able to lower the cost, not only to individual patients, but also to society. And then the fourth one is a little bit, uh, requires a little bit more explanation. The fourth aim, the fourth part of the definition of what we, what we want for our own loved ones is, we wanted a parent to the patient that we in the GBMC healthcare system get it that is a gift to be helping them in their most vulnerable time of life and it should be joyful. It's not a giddy joy, it's not that everybody is running around singing songs all day long, but it's precisely that joy that you get from helping someone and I tell our fabulous nurses who work so, so hard every day that it's precisely on a hard day on their way home 
they should think of just one of the patients they help that day and bring a smile to their face. So those are our four aims. They're nothing more than the definition of the care we would want for our own loved ones. And to the extent that somebody doesn't get that, one of those four things in, a, in an encounter somewhere in the GBMC healthcare system, John, we still have work to do. So let's go back to patient safety for one, for, for, for now. With regards to patient safety, what is your personal definition of patient safety? And what are some of the examples of patient safety issues facing hospitals or healthcare systems across the country? Right, so I think, well, let's make it simple. Uh, a safe patient uh, experience, a safe patient organization is one in which what should happen happens and what should not happen doesn't happen. So an example that everybody can understand is you come, let's say you come into the hospital to have your hip replaced, and let's exaggerate it, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but because someone didn't wash their hands, you get an infection of your new joint. Now it's a bit of an exaggeration, but bear with me. That would be a, a, a bad, unsafe outcome and it would be something that was on the basis of something we could fix. Uh, and I know we're gonna discuss this later on, but we measure these safety events and we put them on our public facing website because we want you to know about those so you can help us get rid of them. And we're gonna to touch up on, the, on, on that information that's available on our website and why we do it. And, you know, we are one of the very few healthcare systems around the country that actually put our metrics, as we call them, for, for public viewing. Um, not many hospitals or healthcare systems across the country do that, but we at GBMC Healthcare System do. Um, let me talk about patient safety. Um, we have a patient safety program at GBMC, uh, but if you can briefly discuss its origins and maybe a couple successes um, of that patient safety program. Sure, so GBMC has, as, as do most hospitals and healthcare systems, we've always had a patient safety system, but going back to that uh, visioning retreat in 2010, we've dramatically improved our system. So uh, again, the owners of GBMC are, are you, the community, your representatives telling me what to do are um, our uh, board, Back in 2011, we did not have a board level patient safety committee. And we didn't think that was a good idea. We thought we needed a, uh, a committee where not only leaders of GBMC, but also board members sat and board members could hear about our failings and our successes so that they could hold us accountable to turn the failures uh, into successes. Um, we have many examples of, uh, of success here. Let me touch on hand hygiene. In 2010, uh, Maryland hospitals joined a program where secret shoppers started watching to see if people were washing their hands before and after they went into a room. And GBMC's initial numbers were, it was a coin flip whether or not somebody washed their hands. It was about 50% of the time uh, we washed our hands. Well, I'm very happy to tell you that now our rates are up in the 95, 96%. And uh, we hold ourselves to a higher bar than the rest of the state because we measure every unit and we uh, give ourselves a failure if you don't wash in and wash out. So we are so much better at that now uh, because of our safety problem, uh, because of our safety program. Another thing is uh, medications. There are thousands and thousands of medications that a physician could order for a patient, and it's a very complex system to have those medications when the nurse needs to give it to a given patient. When we started our program back in 2010, I remember one morning on Unit 38, one of our busier medicine units, the previous day, it was reported to me that 38 times on just one unit, 38 times in a 24-hour period, a nurse went to get a medication for a patient and it was not there. 
Well, through our hard work and our better design of our systems, and you'll hear more about that later, uh, we now will have whole days where not one medication was missing on that unit. We didn't get there by wishing or hoping. We didn't get there by uh, yelling at our people to work harder. We got there by designing better systems. Well, that's, a, that's a great improvement. I mean, dramatic. That's awesome. Uh, what are some of the other safety initiatives you've implemented within GBMC? But before you ask that question, uh, answer that question, I want to encourage everybody watching today to please submit your questions on our Facebook page or audience members. Please feel free to provide that to us. Joining us today is President and CEO of the GBMC Healthcare System, Dr. John Chassar. So Dr. Chassar, let's talk about some of those initiatives uh, within the GBMC Healthcare System. Well, let me tell you uh, about another one, and I don't want to get anybody uh, scared, but going back to 2011, which was seven years ago, uh, we, we started getting much better at measuring events, of knowing precisely how many we had, and then studying every single one. Uh, one of the problems, serious safety events in United States hospitals, is operating on somebody and leaving a foreign object behind, like a lap pad or a sponge or a, God forbid, a, uh, a clip or a clamp. Um, in, in fiscal 2012, uh, we had a significant number of retained foreign objects. And uh, the patients all did fine, and they were all notified, and whatever it was had previously been retrieved. And we realized that we had phenomenal surgeons and phenomenal uh, operating room nurses and technicians. What we did not have is a well-designed system to assure that before the patient left the operating room, everything had been removed. If they had an incision before the incision was closed, everything had been removed. So we wouldn't have to take the patient back to the operating room to remove it later. As I sit before you, I am so proud to tell you we've now gone almost four years with zero retained foreign objects. And we did, again, we didn't get there by wishing or hoping or yelling at our people to work harder, pay more attention, because quite frankly, they were already working very hard. But it's a complex system, and if you don't think like an engineer and assume that humans are fallible and build a system to capture their errors, you won't get anywhere, so we built a system that is now 100% reliable that will check to assure that everything that we started with that shouldn't be in the patient is not in the patient. And uh, I kind of wish that most uh, organizations would have the kind of zeal that we have towards uh, designing these systems. You, you talk about system design and the improvements that have happened over the years, and I think you know you and I in our discussions, both private and in public, we talk about lean daily management. I think that has played a major role in in helping us get to where we need. Um, are we perfect? No, but getting us to where we need to be. Can you talk a little bit about lean daily management, or as we call it, LDM? Sure. I, I've been in healthcare uh, uh, quite a long time. I graduated from medical school in 1868. Um, <laughs> that was supposed to be a joke, and I'm glad that most of you uh, laughed. Uh, in most of the organizations that I've been in, there was a great gap between the people leading the organization and the people doing the work. And frequently, the people leading the organization had no idea what the people doing the work were up against and what their problems were. Um, and the flip side of that coin was also true, that the people doing the work really never heard it from the senior leaders of what the priorities were or what the vision was. I've sp I spent the first 20 years of my career believing that if I could only tell better stories of system design or patient safety, everything would be fine. Uh, five years ago, a, uh, we had a consultant that was helping us get better, improving these systems, and I said to him, Mike, we're making progress, but we're moving too slowly. And he said to me, John, you need to do lean daily management. And I said to him, great, what is that? And he said to me, lean daily management is a 
a system to move improvement to the top of the manager's daily agenda. He said to me, John, your managers are phenomenal. They work their tails off, but they're busy putting fires out almost all day long. Think of the example I already gave you. A manager, you are the nurse manager on a unit with an unreliable medication delivery system. Imagine how many hours that nurse manager was uh, using every day trying to figure out where was the medication and helping her staff get it moved to the department. He said to me, your people are good. They will, they will never find the time to design the systems to make it better so that they're not fixing the same problem every day unless you make it the first thing they do in their day or the second thing and you make it religious. So what is Lean Daily Management? You're gonna learn more about it later, but we, we go on a, every morning at 9 a.m., 365 days out of the year. We do it slightly different on the weekend because my team would quit if I make them work 365 days out of the year. But Monday through Friday, we meet at the executive uh, office at 9 a.m. precisely. We, we review how we did on uh, four system-wide metrics we uh, then divide into five teams, go out on a walk. Each team visits six or seven departments where that manager will present how he or she did in their department on their metrics. Our job as senior leaders is to foster learning, to say thank you, and to remove any barriers that that manager can't fix on his or her own. We then go back to the executive office, we debrief what barriers did we take on, what did we learn. The whole process takes one hour. And you and I have talked about lean daily management. Um, and also, um, one thing that I have to give you a lot of credit. Um, you have- Thank your, you, John. <laughs> he, for those that don't know, Dr. Chassar has a blog called A Healthy Dialogue. And there aren't many president and CEOs of healthcare systems that actually talk about the subject matters that are outlined in a healthy in 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 a healthy dialogue. Dr. Chassar's blog. Um, for more information, I know we have Dr. Chassar here. Of course, it's a limited time, but I encourage you all for more information on what we're doing in the arena of patient safety. I encourage you to go and visit Dr. Chassar's blog called A Healthy Dialogue. Um, we also post the Healthy Dialogue on our GBMC Facebook page. So for those of you that want to go back and see previous editions, you can do it by our Facebook page. Dr. Chassar, we do have a question from one of our audience members. Jessica? We have three questions. Beautiful. First is regarding hand hygiene. What actions are you taking to have the 5% non-compliant staff comply so that patients are protected? Uh, it's a great question. The, uh, th this is a difficult one because when you put the word compliance in, I, uh, just a word of caution, it kind of suggests that people are consciously not washing their hands. We don't actually see that. That last 5% is a nurse is about to do something and a bell goes off and he or she needs to go into a room and from across the room, he or she can see that the patient is about to fall and they dive into the room. Well, that, that's in that 5%. Um, also in that 5% is the, the, the doc is about to go in the room and he's really worried about how he's gonna tee up this question, uh, this conversation with the patient because he's just learned that the patient has cancer. So uh, I, don't, uh, I don't want to uh, lead people astray with believing this is just people not wanting to do it. It's more of the, the, the frailness of humanity. We tried technology. We tried a, an expensive device where it would read your badge and as you walked in, it was gonna alert you. Well, it didn't work. Uh, and a caution against believing that technology is gonna fi fix every problem. One of the clever things that we've just started doing in the emergency department is we have this very colorful sign up right at eye level to try to remind. So in the example of the doctor who's going in to tell somebody they have cancer, he or she is gonna see this sign as they're reaching the threshold, as the trigger to say, 
I know I have really serious things on my mind, but I still have to clean my hands. So those are some of the examples. The other thing is we have, we have um, reports that go out to every manager on a monthly basis. So if there is something different about an individual department, that manager can put his or her thinking cap on with his or her people and have a dialogue about what they need to do next. So, Jessica, you had another question, I think. Question two is, how do you enforce full disclosure to patients by providers in the event of an untoward action? Oh, that's a, that is an outstanding question as well. So again, I've been in healthcare a while, and for the first 20 years of my career, hospital attorneys would run in as soon as they heard there was an event and say, don't say anything. Don't say anything. It's, we need to protect ourselves in court. Healthcare has come a long way. You don't actually protect yourself by not being forthcoming with families. So what we do immediately, if there is an event, we immediately go to the patient and the family and make sure that they're getting the best possible care after the event. That's the first thing we always want to do, to try to reduce whatever the harm is. The next thing we do is we tell them we're very sorry that this happened. We avoid launching into an apology until we're sure we know what happened. I, I can tell you as I sit before you that we have made full disclosure to two or three patients in the last year. Luckily, we don't have a lot of serious safety events, but when we do have events, we make full disclosure to the family as soon as we are sure that we have all of the evidence. Um, because it's very important that the family know exactly what's, what's happening. And we don't want uh, people to be angry because they think we're holding something back. Um, GBMC, and you'll see the chart on our website, uh, we now have very few serious safety events because we've studied all of them, but they still uh, do happen. Last year, we had three falls with injury in the hospital. People are much safer at GBMC than they are in their own homes, literally, by statistics. But if you fall in our building, it's on us. Dr. Jassar, I just want to, there's a lot of things we need to get to, and unfortunately, we're getting low on time. So a couple things. One, you talk about the family and patients, and I'm going to get to that. But I also want to congratulate you and your team for all the work you've done in patient safety. And it's not just us that recognize it, but you also recognize by an outside outside organization called Ashram. You guys won the Ashram Award a couple of years ago. And if you look up on here, you'll see Carolyn Candiello, who's the vice president of, of patient safety, and Lisa Griffey, who's going to be on later on on Greater Living Live. Um, but that's that's a major accomplishment. And, and, and I think it's all the hard work that leadership and those involved right. in LDM have done. So many kudos to you. Let me go back to the patient, all right? That's right. This was a national award from the uh, American Society of Healthcare Risk Management, and GBMC won the first annual patient safety award for the whole country. So I'm a very proud man, but you should be proud that your community health system is among the leaders in this in the country. I want to talk about the other part of the patient safety, and that's the patient themselves. You know, there was this old saying by <laughs> Cy Sims that said, an educated consumer is our best customer, right? So an educated patient, what role do they have in their safety, in, in, in the role of patient safety within the GBMC healthcare system? And do you feel that a well-informed patient can help create a safer GBMC healthcare system? A absolutely. A well-informed patient is another, and maybe the best, tool to uh, help keep uh, himself or herself safe. Um, we, we really want patients to be our partners in care. They need to know what is going to be done and they need to know at least on a uh, basic level why things are being done. And that's a great way to protect themselves and be ready to ask questions if someone is distracted and is about to do something that is not actually part of their plan. Um, back to the hand hygiene, great example. The best way for you to help us get that last 5% is to say to the doctor or nurse, hi, I don't think you washed your hands. 
And because m most of those people have been distracted or they've forgotten. And when you say, I don't think you've washed your hands, they'll say, oh my goodness, and they'll go back and wash their hands. So um, you should do that. You should ask as many questions as you need to ask to feel comfortable that you're part of the plan. A plug for our nurses. GBMC nurses are the best anywhere. They're doing so many tasks every day, it makes me nervous because we keep with the advances of medicine, there's more and more to do. They now practice something called bedside handoff. So nurses generally work 12-hour shifts. At the end of the shift, to assure that both nurses have the same knowledge and the patient has the same knowledge of what is about to happen in the next 12 hours, they have a conversation at the bedside and include the patient in the conversation. If you are an inpatient at GBMC, asking questions at that point is one of your greatest tools to keep yourself safe. And just to go back to the education part that you talked about, and you mentioned earlier about putting up our metrics on the GBMC um, uh, page, and we talk about those metrics, and as you can see, hand hygiene is up there. We also have a central line associated bloodstream infection. So there's a lot of information that is on our website for patients and their families to visit to educate themselves. And, we, and if we didn't believe in ed, an educated patient is key, we wouldn't put information like this and, up on the board. And these data are updated monthly. Uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are desperately trying to inform patients better so that they can uh, compare hospital to hospital. Uh, don't be fooled by things like U.S. News and World Report. That will not stand up to scrutiny of scientists. Doctors don't pay any attention to that. There's a website called Hospital Compare where you can rely on the data. All hospitals have to submit data there. One of the problems with Hospital Compare is to keep hospital executives calm that all the data are truly accurate, there's a long lag time before it gets updated. GBMC's website is up updated every single month. You should ask other hospital executives in Baltimore, why don't you do that so we can better compare you to the others? Dr. Chassar, you've given us a lot of great information today. Um, I, if I didn't get to your questions from the audience or those watching us on Facebook, on Facebook, please remember Greater Living Live, the conversation will continue. So hopefully we can address those questions uh, during our program, Greater Living Live, with Mary Beth Mar Marsden, who's, oh, there she is, hey. And Don Scott, back there. Hey, Don. Um, again, Dr. Chassar, I want to thank you for being here and providing us with all this great information and patient safety. Most importantly, I hope everybody here in our audience and those watching us on Facebook learned something new today. That is really the goal of To Your Health, is for you to become uh, more knowledgeable, whether it's about a health condition or even the subject of patient safety. Next month on To Your Health, we are going to talk about hearing loss and the technology that is out there to help those that have a hearing impairment. But one last thing before I go, and I turn it over to Mary Beth and Don Scott, is later on this month, on Saturday, September 29th, we have our annual Legacy Chase event. And our event, and if you, maybe you can win this beautiful hat, who knows? Uh, our event uh, this year, it's uh, Hats, Horses, and Hope. That's the, um, that's the, the, the theme for this year. Uh, we hold it uh, annually at Shawan Downs, but this year it'll be on Saturday, September 29th. Uh, for more information, please go to LegacyChase.org. That is the website. Uh, that's where you'll find that beautiful artistic work right there. Um, again, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you all for joining us. Hey, Mindy, you want to take this? It would look good on you, by the way. I think you should put it on. Everybody, until the next time, Dr. Chisar, here's to your health. Thank you, John. Cheers.